Okay, welcome everyone to uh, When Tomorrow Comes. Uh, it's my first foray into the office to do this, so it's, uh, it's nice to have some air conditioning on as it's a, a hot day. Uh, we're joined, uh, as, as usual actually, by Ashley and Dan. Hi guys, you all right? Hi Ian, yes, good. Good to see you, but we've also got a special guest. We've got Sue Smith who's joining us today. Sue is, uh, nice to see you Sue. And Julian and the others. Uh, so we met, we met Sue originally, uh, probably four or so years ago, when you were still in your joint chief exec role, so you weren't you at the time for South Northampton, Cherwell. Um, and you were very, uh, very generous to give us a lot of your time to sit on what we'd formed as a Sustainable Development Commission, a very grandly titled uh, name, uh, which was, uh, that was commissioned chaired by uh, Nick Rainsford. And Dan, that's probably a good segue for you to explain your blog for the week. And then from there, we can go on to talk about some of the issues that uh, we've raised previously with Sue and then talk really about some of the ideas that are coming through from the planning white paper. So Dan, I'll hand over to you just to give an intro. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, so yeah, so, so this week's email was really focused on one of the, one of the um, proposals contained within the planning white paper released last week. We want, we want to try and cover various different aspects of it and I'm sure there'll be more vlogs and pieces from Iceni and from the When Tomorrow Comes team in, in coming weeks. But this one was mainly focused on the proposed um, replacement of the test of soundness for, for local plans with what's been called a sustainable development test. Um, and actually when um, I joined Iceni a few years ago, we were already working on a, a sustainable development scorecard which was basically aimed at taking some of the ambiguity out of the assessment process of determining whether development is or isn't sustainable and allows users from any sort of background to determine whether development proposals fit the NPPF's definition of what constitutes sustainable development. So we did this as a free to access web-based tool um, and you know, in terms of the, the digitization of the planning process, increasing engagement, increasing democracy, all of which mentioned in the white paper. You know, these are, these are things that we've been working on for, for a good few years anyway. So it was, it's good to see that sort of thing um, mentioned in the planning white paper. And um, you know, we're really keen to get involved and, and take it forward somehow. Um, so Sue, um, I know you spend a lot of your time now thinking about how we can be better at swimming. Uh, but you also still spend time uh, with working on the Graven Hill project. So I know you still keep your hand in on uh, on planning and uh, the wider development issues. I'm guessing like most people, you've had a, uh, a flick through the, the planning white paper, uh, be interested in your uh, overarching thoughts, uh, particularly in the context of what Dan's just discussed on sustainability. Okay, thanks Ian. So where I'm coming from is partly on the back of a 37 year career in local government, but I'm not a planner, however, as a senior officer in a council and in the last 15 years as a chief exec, uh, you are heavily involved in planning, whether you are a planner or not. And that, that was great because I loved it. Um, but in my current role, uh, I'm chairman of a development company that's doing self and custom build, but is wholly owned by a council. So we're in quite a, an unusual position where um, the shareholder is the council, um, some may think we get preferential treatment through planning. Uh, I can assure everyone that is absolutely not the case. So I sit here <laughs> as someone who has worked in local authorities and dealt with communities, with national organisations, trying to get planning to work, to deliver what is needed. Um, but also as chairman of a development company going, why is it so difficult to get something done? particularly when we have the local planning authority and, and the council on board as effectively it's their scheme we're trying to deliver. So at, at a very high level, um, the white paper, great, okay, let's get rid of some of the blockages. But what I haven't seen is actually an assessment of what are the, the current barriers to development at a scale that somebody thinks we need to have with a number put on it, the government. Um, and I don't think it addresses all of them. I think it's honed in on just one aspect of it. And my fear is some of the really good stuff that has happened in the last 
sort of 10 to 20 years. And I'll include the scorecard in that, but lots of other really good work, methods of construction, the environmental concerns, and all sorts of things could easily be swept aside uh, in that rush to deliver numbers. Because I think we all know, you know, someone is going to get charged every year. There's your number, get that number done almost and we don't care how so that, that for me is how it reads so without that attention to quality um, and without taking on board the learning that we've had over the last i say 10 to 20 years i mean it goes be before that as well but in particular you know the recent learning that um, the whole sector's had and communities about what works and actually what doesn't work and let's learn from what hasn't worked in the past and not recreate some of the awful developments that were thrown up post-war, similar issue. We need lots of housing quickly. Okay, let's do it. And then you look back and you think, oh, crikey, maybe that wasn't the best way to do it. And we didn't think about this and that. So that's my concern, Ian. Um, yeah. And also uh, utilities, how many developments actually get stuck because you can't get enough electricity or gas or broadband to the site or of the speed that is actually needed. You know, it's, it's got to be more of a holistic approach rather than just picking on one aspect um, of what you need to, to do to, to bring forward development. Sure. Okay. So I, I guess, know, Ashley, that, that's where I'm coming from. Um, no, no, thanks. So um, I guess, Ashley, the, the danger of, uh, of trying to, have a conversation about you know the scorecard sustainability within the context of the white paper is that there's so many areas you could sort of delve into because it it does as Stu suggested it does ask a lot of those sort of you know what ifs and what next sort of questions um but but i guess trying to bring it back to the point of the scorecard i doubt there's too many planners that would uh, would weep at the idea of uh, if, if we start with the primacy of the development plan about moving away from a kind of a, uh, a process driven soundness approach to something which is more about is development sustainable? Yeah, is that fair? yeah, no, I think I think I would agree. And I think I share Sue's concerns, you know, about some of the things in the white paper regarding, you know, are they trying to just bring things forward too quickly at the sake of delivering quality and also, you know, um, sustainable development as well. But that's where I think that actually having something like a sustainable development test that's measurable and that is easy to understand, i.e. pretty much what we have in the scorecard, it, that makes it then easier for people to deliver that as well. It makes it something that everyone can understand uh, because it's something that, you know, we, we deal with a lot of different clients who, you know, our role is to try and get them to understand the positive benefits that bringing forward a sustainable positive development can bring to an area. And often they can't see the measurable benefits of that. And so if you had something that was, was easy and was able for everyone to access, then it might mean that it, it's something that actually drives forward better quality and more sustainable development, as well as getting things delivered on time as well. So I'm, I'm hopeful, I am quite hopeful actually, that this idea of a, a sort of test, uh, whether it takes the same form as something we've done with the scorecard or it is something different, um, it will actually just, you know, make things a bit more streamlined. I mean, that quality, sustainability, and kind of delivery can happen alongside one another. Um, but I suppose, um, I'm not sure, Dan, are, are there details on, on what this test could, would look like? Or is it, is it, you know, a bit up in the air at the moment? Not, not yet. I mean, what, what the, one, of, one of the comments in the white paper, it says that the, the, the concept of sustainable development is well understood. Um, which I would argue it, it isn't well understood. I mean, everyone knows what, what you know, a, a, a sustainable development is in the lens of the MPPF. It's refers to economic, social and environmental sustainability. It delivers all three. Everyone understands that concept, but, but joining the dots between that very high level theory and actually what that looks like in terms of a, 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 a scheme, what do you actually put on the ground, is, is you know, there, there's, there's gaps there. Um, and what a sustainable development test or a scorecard should do is address those gaps and provide a measurable, quantifiable metric by which you can say, we're delivering this much social value, we're delivering this much environmental net gain, 
um, we're delivering this much economic benefit. There are methodologies and um, you know schemes out there that, that that will give you that information. So you know it, it's about sort of joining up all those dots to make sure that that you know people consider all of the three different pillars of sustainable development and actually go through with that thing and it doesn't get washed out when schemes go through the planning system. Dare I say, Sue, that was the whole point of the scorecard, wasn't it? That we, we took <laughs> difficult, complex policies and we boiled it down into easily understood, you know, uh, a criteria that anybody could look at. And I know when we tested it, we, we actually tested it almost at the local plan stage, if you like, against where allocated sites could come forward. And uh, at its simplest level, we were asking people to judge whether they were good sites or not, weren't we? Indeed. Yeah. So thank you, government, for publishing a paper that um, justifies the use of the balanced scorecard. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it fits neatly, Ian. But uh, on, on a serious point, when I mean, Ashley was talking about accessibility and you know, a different way of actually dealing with planning um, so that more people can be involved, the language needs to change. So, you know, there's, yeah. there's great talk about let's use IT. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, great. OK. Um, so that, that's quite a big expense that we need sorting. I'm not saying that's wrong, but the language and the how people can actually have that sort of interface with the planning system, because it still will be a, a planning system, just different to the one that we've known, is absolutely crucial. And the work we did on that scorecard was to make sure that people like me and others who are not uh, trained planners actually understand what's going on and can therefore have an informed view. Yeah. And so and with the NIMBYism that, you know, sometimes yeah. the view on planning is pure NIMBYism. Well, well let, let's move on from that. Let's make it a more mature conversation um, and hopefully get better decision making on the back of that. Um, and so, I, I mean, it would be remiss of me not to ask you to perhaps reflect on what you've learned so far with Graven Hill and because also of course the white paper does talk positively about trying to change the sort of homogenous nature of house building there is emphasis on uh, giving people more choice whether it's through custom build or self build or first homes It'd be interesting to get your thoughts on on that and also whether that point about language whether you've learned things along the way from explaining the, the opportunity with Graven Hill whether there are sort of you've got any suggestions there as to how you can change the the way you communicate with public? I, I, I mean, we have got loads of learning that we can share, you know, being the largest summit in the country that's having a go at this. Uh, how naive were we when we started is all I can say. Um, I think we thought that uh, having assembled the land, being wholly owned by the shareholder and uh, having the LPA on side would, would do it, that'd be it. Uh, we had a local development order in place for the first phase of the housing. That, that was hard work, um, but that is absolutely key to trying to get some form of momentum um, at a speed that the self-builders want, but even then it's slow. So that there's learning for the people that go into self-build, because many of them are first-timers, not all, but many are. And in this country, we're not used to it. I mean, if you go to Germany and Holland, you know, people will know friends and family that have done self-build or custom build. So there'll be slightly more awareness of what's involved. Um, but just that whole notion of what choices do you have? How much effort do you need to put in? But what's the gain and the benefit you can get at the end? Yeah, just telling that story in, in a simple language that isn't um, like the really grand individual designs on grand designs and i'm trying to be careful how i say that because kevin mcleod obviously filmed us um, and 10 of the builders on our site but normally when people see homes on his program they're big they're expensive they're out of reach for, for most people and although they watch the program they don't think oh i could do that and i think we need to get down to i could do that and i could actually take ownership because that for me is the key thing. What, what we have now at Graven Hill is 200 families um, living on site already. There'll be 1,800 homes when we're finished, so you know, a long way to go. But it, it's a really strong community because everybody there has 
made more of an effort to get their home than going down to a sales office and saying, I'll have that one, please. Yeah, so there's yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, more input, and you put all of these people together, and it is so powerful. So that they're going to help going forward. They're going to help to promote um, self and custom build in this country, but we need to roll it out at pace across the whole country, not just in a hotspot in Vista. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be replicated elsewhere, but it hasn't been. Mm. And it hasn't been through lack of effort on our part. We've been all over the place for years, talking to councils, talking to other organisations. I've lost track of how many housing ministers we've hosted because they seem to change on a fairly regular basis. <laughs> yeah, and, I, you know, they all want to come and see it. Great, they come and see it. Then nothing happens. Then we get another one. But maybe this is the chance to actually give it a real push. But it needs to be more than just us as a council and company actually doing that. Um, the, Dan, story, uh, the story coming out from these folk that have, have done it, you know, some who have literally laid bricks themselves or even made the bricks in some cases to then lay, and others who have um, had a, an off-site manufactured house done to their design. Uh, it, amazing stories coming out of it, and many of them, not just the odd one and not just that huge one that looks fantastic on the TV, but you haven't you know, it's, it's aspirational stuff, fantasy, almost. That's brilliant. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Dan, I, I know uh, we're probably running a little bit short of time now. Um, did you want to just sort of have a, a sweep up? And I don't know whether there's any uh, any ask you'd have, um, you know, uh, whether it's around what the issue Sue's talked about or uh, more specifically around the scorecard and, and, and the ideas and how that might play into the... Uh, what well, hopefully will be the, the the white paper going forward into action. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the white paper develops. Um, you know, I, like like many people read it, you, you you read it and you think well, there's some good stuff in there. There's there's some stuff in there that's going to be tricky, and there's some stuff in there that you know you're you're going to have some significant opposition to it at various levels. Um, and in regard to the sustainable development test, I'm really interested to see what, what everyone thinks of that, whether they think that this is going to make their lives easier, whether it's going to make their lives harder, it depends on what, what the test consists of. But, you know, what, what do you think it should consist of? I've got my own ideas, but, you know, I, 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 I'm not a planner, I'm an engineer. So, um, you know, planners, developers, everyone else is going to have their own thoughts on what should go into a sustainable development test. So it would be really interesting to start gathering some of those views together. Who knows, we might even need a new sustainable development commission uh, going forward to look at this. Blatant plug there. All right, thanks for that. Blatant. Um, Blatant. Uh, my stomach's rumbling, which tells me it's nearly lunchtime. So thanks for joining us. I uh, really appreciate it. Okay. We probably, probably, we were probably remiss at not asking you to come on to the the vlog before to talk specifically about Craven Hill. So um, I'm glad you've had a chance to um, give us an update on that. It's always interesting to hear about uh, custom build. Uh, Ashley, Dan, thanks as per usual for joining us. Uh, for those watching, thank you very much. See you next time. All the best. Thank you all.